Thank you, um, Rene Hartman, and other friends at the International League of Non-Religious and Atheists for yet another opportunity to meet and exchange ideas. Um, for me, I think there was something missing in the theme of the conference uh, when we said, uh, give peace a chance. Um, I thought maybe we would have added another line Stop the war against free speech. Stop the war, stop the fight against freedom of expression. Because for me, that is actually what is at stake. Whether it's in Denmark or in Bangladesh or in France, it's all about the battle against free speech. So as we gather here in Cologne, uh, asking the religious gladiators to put down their arms and give peace a chance, we make the best gestures which enlightened and civilized mind could make in the face of dangers that we confront, in the face of the risk we run, due to the activities of those whose notion of the world is opposed to our harmonious coexistence. But are we going to allow them to win the battle? Are we going to allow, are we going to surrender to the forces of jihadist Islam? Of course, the answer is no. While extending the olive branch to religious militants, it is important to understand the disposition of the warring parties. You know, I just want us here to, okay, let's look at the mind of these people, their mindset. Yes, let's get into their mind. Let's take it that, yeah, they want peace. But what kind of peace do they want? Yeah, let's look at their mindset, their disposition. Their disposition to embracing proposed peace, to agreeing and respecting uh, peace accord, lest such an appeal falls on deaf ears and becomes an exercise in fertility. Yes, when we say give peace a chance, whom are we talking to? Are we talking to ourselves? I think that's a, we are having a conversation with some people. Let's look at their mindset. Yeah, so a lot has been said about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the counter terrorism campaign of Western countries, the crisis in the Middle East, and how the the, the foreign policies of Western nations have been behind the murderous campaigns of Muslim jihadists and extremists around the globe. They tell us that the foreign policies of Europe and America are justifications and legitimate triggers of jihadi attacks and the killing of innocent citizens, even in Africa. A lot has been said about the so-called Islamophobia, but very little attention has been paid to the raging forces of Islam-based phobia prejudice in many parts of the world. Incidentally, there is limited focus on the holy wars, Islamic holy wars in Africa, the religious bloodletting that's been going on for centuries. It's not new. For us in Nigeria, attacks killings by Muslim fanatics, they are not new. These attacks are not new. So we need to focus on how religious extremism has undermined the prospects of peace in the region. Now, recently, an ex-Muslim from northern Nigeria posted a message on the Facebook page of the Nigerian Humanist Movement, and it says, I don't know what more Islam wants from my society. We are black African people with thousands of years of our own religion, social cultural identities, but we have discarded all that and have taken Islam as our religion except for a few Christians. We have completely embraced as ours the Arab culture and social order. We have lost half of our language to Arabic. I cannot list 20 full Hausa traditional names because we only bear Arabic names. Sadly, our traditional names are forbidden, haram, in the Arabic religion. What more do you want? We live in a country with a secular constitution, but we are ruled with the Sharia law, and we don't see the irony when a Christian Igbo soldier dies in Gwoza, that's one of the towns where Nigeria is battling Boko Haram, defending the Islamic monster our Sharia created. What more does Islam want? Please tell me. We force our girls to wear the hijab, but never care to equip them with skills and education for their future. 
we have turned all our children into Quranic scholars. And you know, they have a way of qualifying these people as scholars. And I, from what I know about scholarship, I don't think that these people should actually be called scholars. Yeah, so our school curriculum is written in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. We are as uneducated as the Americans. Our youths are as stupid as them too because we have successfully broken all alcohol bottles. Now we take hard drugs only. See, there are thousands of mosques and madrasas in my own town. There is one for every Islamic sect, from Shia Imamiya, Shia is Isma Ashiria, to Sunni Tariqa, Sunni Sufi, Sunni Wahhabi, to the Pakistani unknown sect. We have everything that Islam has vo ever vomited. We are total Muslims here. In fact, we have had our suicide bombers, our beheading, mosque attacks, church attack, uh, car bombs, schoolboy slaughter, all of that Arab style. What more do you want, O Islam? Yes. So Hafiz, ba Hafiz Bawa is not, the, is not uh, a lonely voice. He's not the only person who has this concern in northern Nigeria. Because there's a ground swell, there's a, a movement, there's an awakening in northern Nigeria. And, I, and we hope that this awakening will lead to a renaissance that will transform that country. So drawing from my experiences growing up in Nigeria, we are Boko Haram militants have been killing, maiming, kidnapping in furtherance of their campaign to enforce Sharia law and realize an Islamic state. Growing up in a country where Islamic theocrats have consistently used the agenda of political Islam to undermine the evolution of secular democracy and equal citizenship. Coming from a continent where imperialist Islam is entrenched in many countries and the bloodletting campaign of Al-Shabaab in East Africa and other Islamic militant groups is showing no sign of abetting. I want to address the question, will Muslim jihadists give peace a chance in Africa? First of all, we need to bear in mind that the cases of Islamic militancy in Africa have sometimes international roots. Islam is a foreign religion introduced to Africa in the seventh century by jihadist holy warriors from the Middle East. And Middle Eastern countries still sponsor and underwrite the propagation of Islam in the region through trade and commerce. Yeah, as in no cause. You know, it has nothing to do with religion. We're just doing business, right? Building mosques, covert and overt madrasa schools. See, yeah, because they have also their own educational campaign. This is what I was, dis uh, I was discussing with um, uh, PZ yesterday. These people have their own educational campaign. So we are telling them they need education. They have it already. It's going on in their schools. So what kind of education do you want to, are you expecting them to have? So. So they have these madrasa schools that are building across. In the, in the north of Ghana, where I'm doing my field work, Iran is funding the, building, the, 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 the construction of mosques and schools together. They go together. So they have their own school, they have their curriculum, they have what they call education. So we must acknowledge and bring into perspective these transcontinental routes if we stand the chance of achieving peace in the region. Of course, we cannot divest Africans of responsibility and agency. You know, there's always this tendency, I said, oh yeah, the West is responsible, Islam is responsible, Saudi Arabia is responsible, you know. Where lies the agency of Africans? That's a problem. But at the same time, we need to understand that jihadist Islam is not a local issue. Yes, it's not. It's a global campaign. Much of Islam, Islamic militants attacks in Africa are extensions and reactions to religious battles raging in other parts of the world. Think about the attacks and killing of Christians or non-Muslims in Niger and Nigeria by jihadists and militants protesting the cartooning of their prophets in Denmark and France, far away. They cartooned Mohammed in France, they killed somebody in Borno State in Nigeria. What's the connection? What's the connection? And let me tell you, the people that are killing did not see this cartoon, they didn't know about the cartoon. So it's like people come around with matches and knives one morning and start killing you for something you did not know or you don't know about. So that is it. And we have to understand jihadist Islam in this way, that somebody could commit a crime in Indonesia and the person, somebody in Nigeria is punished for, for that crime, in quote. 
So jihadist attack in Africa are they are political. They are fronts for the politics of competition between countries and block of states. The policies of domination and control of nations and groups of nations by the likes of OIC. They use economic incentives. In Nigeria, when they wanted Nigeria to join OIC, they told us it has nothing to do with Islam. Okay? That is all about economic development. It's all about trade and commerce. What happened at the end of the day? So these are ploys. These are devices. These are strategies they are using. So they use development aid to woo poor African countries to endorse and embrace strictly Islamic positions on issues that sometimes negatively affect their own citizens, like human rights issues at the United Nations. Countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, wield a lot of influence in this politics, and they have a lot at stake in the business of holy war and peace in the region. Now, jihadist Islam is not only about politics of nations, but also the policies of ideology of texts, traditions, dogmas, interpretations, doctrines. Religious conflicts are rooted in doctrinal disagreements and sectarian divisions and differences cast on the stone of dogma and absolutism, on teachings that are not prone to change or revision, at least not by the African midgets in this Mohammedan enterprise. You see, there are people want to in Nigeria, people want to be, you know, as Islamic as they can. You know, they want to stick to the letter of Islam. They, they don't want to alter it. Because when they alter it, you know, it, it's not for them. It is for the, the, the people in Saudi Arabia. Because they will have to see the moon first before they stop fasting in Nigeria. Okay? And you know, sometimes we are not on the same time zone. <laughs> you know, so they, this, this people will keep fasting, you know, waiting for these people to, to stop. And they tell them, okay, now you can now stop fasting. They say, okay, yeah, we have to stop fasting. So that's it. It's all about control. It's all about manipulation. So these African, trans-African connections, these ideological issues, deem the prospect of peace in the region, in the face of jihadist Islam because they hampered the ability of Africans to freely dismantle the machinery of war, of exploitation, the infrastructure of jihad and Islamic inquisition. They can't do it, because you need to wait for the sheikh. And the sheikh needs to wait for the sheikh in Saudi Arabia, or Iran, or Sudan, or Pakistan. So there's that chain of command. So they can't take decisions on their own. That's it. And we were discussing yesterday about colonialism. We said. Islam has become a text for colonization. Yeah, because Muslims, in quote, in Nigeria, can think, they cannot think freely. They can say, oh, no, we don't want this. Yeah, because, because you know, you need to see the permission of the sheikh. The sheikh has to seek the permission of the grand mufti or whatever they call them in Saudi Arabia or Iran. You know, so that is it. So in the face of the religious war against free speech, there's a tendency for us to think that the notion of peace is only known to us. Yeah, the peace we are talking about. That peace is alien to the conscience and constitution of Islamic jihadists and militants. Islamic militants have their own notion of peace. And they are fighting to achieve it. They are fighting to the last man to realize their own idea of a peaceful world. And let's take note, fighting in this case, dying in the course of this battle, is a passport to real peace. Yes. You, you, you want peace, you want dialogue. No. They want to use fighting because even when they die fighting, they go to heaven. So, so we have to understand. The people we are saying give peace a chance, we have to understand their strategy. Because by eliminating us as we are telling them, please give peace a chance, they are already inheriting their own peaceful place. So what we have out there is then competing notions of peace. Like in Nigeria, when we had the democracy in 1999, they told us that without Sharia, there was no way that they could go ahead with democracy. Yeah. And they had to impose Sharia on the northern states. But what's the situation today? Boko Haram came and said, you are not doing it. Uh, you know, it's not good enough. You, the Sharia you are implementing is not pure. We need the real Sharia. So they came with a campaign for real Sharia. Now, if we allow Boko Haram, another group will come again and say, look, Boko Haram is not doing it well. We need another real Sharia. And from there, conflict, crisis continues. So Muslim jihadists have their own conception of peace that is different from what we 
for what, from what we have or what we hold and cherish. So what is this notion of peace? The jihadist peace is transcendental, not fully achievable in this world. The real peace, like the conception of happiness, is realizable in afterlife, when we are dead. So what we, what we can attain for them in this life is just a shadow of that real peace, locked up and kept in paradise just for a few. And look at the few they kept that peace for. Those who engage in suicide bombing. Those who leech and behead blasphemers. Those who execute writers and, uh, and artists. Those who avenge the insult on Islam or the prophet. Those who kill persons who desecrate or burn the Quran. Those who murder and imprison apostates. Friends, I mean, those who are going to populate this place of peace for the jihadists risk like the roll call of the most dangerous criminals in the world. So the rich tragedy is that this shadowy notion of peace is more valuable than human life, human rights, dignity, the dignity of women, children, and homosexuals. So Islamic militants are ready to kill and maim, to kidnap, they are ready to kidnap to achieve this peace, which I call peace in the graveyard of freedom. Peace in the graveyard of tolerance and human rights. Peace in the graveyard of education. At a public hearing on a state-sponsored anti-same-sex marriage bill in Abuja in 2007, I attended that public hearing. A Muslim scholar told the gathering that there was no debate on homosexuality under Sharia law. So we should know that the people we are talking about, there's no debate in their conversation. There's no place for debate. So that was a statement he made. So he suggested that few homosexuals in the country be rounded up and killed. And sometimes the minority is destroyed, he said, in order to protect the majority. Look, nobody expressed outrage or objection because an Islamic scholar has spoken. Even when he speaks, nonsense. And that is a challenge we have. Whether you're an Islamic scholar or not, if you say something that is nonsensical and outrageous, we should say it. Yes. Now, look, 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 look at it. It is not Allah that is speaking. Let's assume Allah speaks, and Allah speaks nonsense. You say, sorry, excuse me, Allah, this is nonsense. Now, Allah sends a messenger who speaks something we find outrageous. Excuse me, this is outrageous. You shouldn't be speaking. We shouldn't listen to you. We're not going to follow you. We should not say, oh, because we, want to, we don't want to offend them. Offend who? We should not sacrifice our ideal on the altar of offense. No. We should stand with those ideals. For me, for me, that is a defining point. If you want to help us from this part of the world, don't just move in and tell us, oh, yeah, we don't want to take this decision. You know, like my friend yesterday, she was saying, oh, no, we should not snub Turkey so that the youths will not... Uh, you know, get, go anti-Western. Let them go anti-Western and then, and so what? If, if Turkish youth become anti-Western, then what happens? They need education. That's what they need. And they should understand that this part of the world cannot sacrifice the ideals. Ideals that people died for, for centuries here. On, on the altar of not offending youths. Youths, by their age, they need education. So we should actually give them education. If offending them is a way to give them education, let's offend them and stand with our ideals. So, Muslim jihadists want to give peace a chance only within the framework of sharias. Take note, I didn't say sharia. I said sharias. Why? Because each militant group has its own version of sharia. And jihadist organizations want to impose different and competing versions of Sharia. That's what is happening in the Middle East. Sunni this, Shiite this, and all that. You ask, okay, what is happening? They said, oh, no, we need the Sunni Sharia. We need Shia Sharia. And if you go there, they will start listing other Sharia. And you tell them, hold on a moment. How many Sharias are we going to implement? Can you bring one text, please? Let's look at it. So that is it. So there is confusion. Even in the in Islamic world. Yes. And when the 
they present it to us, they present it as a holistic text. No, we have many, we have many of them. So take, for instance, the case of Boko Haram in Nigeria. Sorry. I think I, yeah. <clears throat> take, for instance, the case of Boko Haram in Nigeria. This group, whose name roughly translates Western education is forbidden, has been fighting to enthrone Sharia law and turn Nigeria into an Islamic state. So the group is against any form of peace that is outside the framework of their own version of Sharia, because we have already Sharia in the north, and they're fighting for another one. So the same thing applies to al Shabab, that have been killing and maiming people across East Africa. Yes, of course, this was an attack launched by al Shabab, And I have launched so many of such attacks. Now, you kill these people. When you kill these people, you get to power. Whom are you going to govern? Who are you going to govern? Now, hold on. There are people that offended you. Is it the students who are sleeping in their dormitories that offended you? Who offended you? And why should you kill them? So this is the challenge. So the jihadist notion of peace is opposed to secular values and ideas. To Islamists, secularism is a taboo. In Nigeria, whenever we're having debates and we said, oh no, Nigeria is secular, I said no. There is no place for secularism under Islam. That Islam is a way of life, is politics and all that. We should start challenging that. We have in this part of the world, we have campaigned for separation of church and state. They have to start, if they have not started campaigning for the separation of mosque and state. Yes. So they tell us it's a taboo because, because of the liberating and emancipatory tendencies of secularism. Secularization is opposed to their own idea of the world, to the, their own idea of the state. So Islamic... Islamists would not want to give peace a chance in Africa until the claims of absolute inherent and eternal truth of Islam, of the Quran, of Hadith, is challenged. Quranic teachings have to be critically examined. Yes, we need to know when was this book written and who wrote it. Yeah, it's not enough to tell us that it was dictated to an illiterate in a cave. Are you talking to a child? This is what you can tell your children. You know, the Santa Claus kind of thing, you know? You, and as an adult, somebody who is a scholar comes to me and you're telling me the whole book was dictated to an illiterate in a cave. Are you joking? <laughs> and you think I should take you seriously? And I should not make caricature of that, right? <laughs> but you are making caricature of yourself. <laughs> Peace will continue to elude many parts of my region Africa, till the terror of militant Islam is overruled by the values of free thought, freedom of expression, critical thinking, free inquiry, and freedom of religion and belief. So there is competition there. And we have to ask ourselves, where do we stand? This idea of you don't want to offend people. Okay, you don't want to offend people. Where are you standing? On the fence? There is no position there. If you stand on the fence, you will fall off. You get to one side. So we need to take a stand because there is a competition going on. And we have to make it clear, we stand with free thought. We stand with freedom of expression. Even though you may not agree with what people are thinking and what they are writing and what they are drawing. So, we will not have peace if people across Africa and the world begin to exercise these rights without fear of being killed or being executed by jihadists. So, if, it's, if it is okay for Muslim groups to question laws and policies, norms and morals, human rights provisions and the religious beliefs of people, of states, if it is allowed that Muslim scholars preach, propagate myths and misconceptions about, about Muhammad, they propagate messages of uh, um, Islamic messages, Islamic messages suffused with uh, prejudice and <laughs> some other notions of the world, then it is, it should not be deemed offensive to question Islamic teachings or use satire to expose the absurdities, misconceptions, contradictions embedded in Islam or in the life and teachings of Prophet Muhammad. Now, I would like to conclude with this. This one just happened a couple of days ago. So some days ago, the leader of, of uh, Hishba, that's the man there, the Sharia police in Kano, he asked for capital punishment for seven Tijaniya Muslims accused of blasphemy and of insulting Prophet Muhammad. 
So this one, they're not accusing uh, Salman Rushdie of blasphemy. No. They're accusing Muslims of another sect. So the, the leader of Hijba issued a statement and he said, after sufficient investigation against this corrupt and insensible apostates, adherents of Hakika, we have confirmed that they have insulted the prophet beyond, be, peace be unto him, and Hijba has, be, has begun criminal investigation or proceedings against them. We have arrested some of them, and we are looking for the rest for immediate punishment of death in, in, uh, as the Sharia prescribes. So he goes on to call Jews, Christians, uh, they are all apostates, but these ones have committed worst apostasy for him. So in conclusion, friends, we need a global campaign against Islamic privilege and an effective program to support ex-Muslims, apostates, and blasphemers. And here we're talking about apostates and blasphemers, not only those who renounce Islam, but also Muslims themselves who are charged and who are also accused of blasphemy. And we should make the Muslim world to understand that the campaign against blasphemy is not just in the interest of free thinkers and those who insult Islam, as they say, or those who are outside Islam, but also including those who are inside Islam, Muslims themselves. We have to make them understand it's in their interest. So politicians in, in Europe and America can also help us. They can, they can create the chance for peace or at least facilitate it by refusing to cave in to pressure from Islamist government or turning a bland, uh, bland eye on the fight against freedom of expression in Africa and in other parts of the world. Thank you. My question is uh, maybe because I'm just unaware of the situation in Nigeria, how much of the population is uh, Muslim and how much is Christian? Okay. Um, well, before, before stating that, um, we have never had any credible census in Nigeria. Yes. So everything we are doing is just kind of projection, estimates. Yeah. So I think they said we have around 40% Muslim, 40% uh, Christian then. 10% in between the kind of traditional religionists and uh, maybe non-religious people, yeah. Uh, hi, Leo. Um, I, I, I want to know if, uh, who, who gives weapons to this, to this person, of course. I think it's the, the right question. No? Do yeah. you, you don't think? Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. And I've also asked that question. Um, but... <clears throat> When they started, and because we have had a series of this kind of groups coming up, actually they, they used to start with bows and arrows and knives, you know, machete, that's what they use in those days. But now they have changed. Um, some people tell us that much of the arms, they came from Libya, you know, the flow of arms. When Libya collapsed, you know, some of the arms came through Libya. Um, but they have started before Libya collapsed. Yeah, so I think that, you know, there are some criminal gangs, you know, who patronize them, but I really don't know. But there are people who, I think, supply them amps. Uh, I, I'm afraid that to, to, to put uh, blood and fire in, in Africa, uh, America and also uh, France and all, also uh, uh, merchant of weapons uh, are... Yes. Uh, 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 responsible. Yeah, responsible. Yeah, responsible. Yeah. You see, I have had this argument with, I have a German colleague of mine, and we have had this argument and, uh, as to, yeah, the, the arms manufacturing countries are part of the problem. I agree. I agree, they're part of the problem. But is it only arms that are manufacturing? And the, I told him that I'm here in Germany, and I have a choice to go and look for where they're selling books and also look where they're selling arms. I have a choice to look for where they're, where they're selling drugs or where they're selling medication for my health. You know? So I try to say that there are arms in the world. But yes, that's why I said when we try to push away the responsibility, oh, they produce the arms. Now, let me tell you one thing I find irritating about the situation in Rwanda, Rwandan genocide. I was reading something on Rwandan genocide, and somebody said 
that the machetes they used during the genocide was imported from China. Okay? You imported machetes from China, then they were telling you to go and kill your neighbors with that? Is that what they're telling me? So I am not saying that the arms company, they don't have a, a role to play. France, they have a role to play. Because like I said, like, like I said, I told a friend, look, if America can monitor drugs, the sale of drugs in all countries, including Nigeria, they can also monitor the flow of arms in the world. Yes, they can. OK? OK, but you know one thing? I'm sick and tired of getting into a discourse. People will be telling me, oh, it's America. Oh, it's France. Is France telling me which part of my room to sleep? Is France telling me the coat to put on in the morning? Is France telling me the choices I have to make? This is the work for France to do. But I still think that people in Nigeria have their work, their, their own work to do. Botswana is also have arms. They're not fighting. Why? Is, 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 is France or, or America not selling arms to them? So this is a work that has to do. They have their own responsibility. But Africans have also their responsibility. And it's only when both of us work together, accepting our responsibility, that we can have peace. So, well, uh, I want to say the way that you introduce weapon as uh, jelly gum, so everyone can go and buy jelly gum and eat by for diet or not, uh, don't eat because have uh, like I don't like I don't like jelly gum. So weapons, you when when you sell weapons, uh, you know to who you are selling, mm -hmm. and who is your customer, mm -hmm. and it's not like going and reading book in bookstore, buying a book, mm -hmm. which book I like, or mm -hmm. go to I'm sick, mm -hmm. give me medicine. Mm -hmm. So those people that buying and selling, they know their customers and they know to who they are selling, for who they are uh, producing these mm -hmm. weapons. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. And I have, I've already said they have a responsibility. If they can monitor the drugs, the sale of drugs, and uh, even remove uh, a, the president of a country because of drug-related issues in the past, they can also monitor this. But like I said, like I also said, the people that are selling these things, sometimes they sell it. I think we also need arms to protect ourselves, don't we? We need that. Yeah, if, I mean, we need arms to protect ourselves. So what I'm saying there is that there is a choice, I believe. You know, we in, the, in, that's in Africa, we have to make that choice. We can't keep saying, oh, we, 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 we perpetrated the genocide because you know, we imported machete from China. Are you a kid? I don't want to engage in that discussion. Because the question I'll ask you is that there's a machete in my house. I've not used it to kill my father. OK? Yes. So I am, you know, don't get me wrong. What I'm saying here now is that, yes, we can get to tomorrow and keep saying, oh, France, uh, America, you are the problem. Yes. But I will go home and ask my colleagues. I say, hold on, man. You got this gun. Did France tell you to go and kill you? I never would it. Yeah. But you, if you go to the market, you also have a choice not to buy arms. And there are African countries, and I'm, I've cited, who import arms from these countries. But they don't use it to fight themselves. Why? So why can't we learn from them? Because I don't want to stay here and say, oh, until, until France stop importing arms or selling arms, then we will stop killing ourselves. That's rubbish. For me, it's rubbish. I must exercise my right to buy your arms or not. Yes. And even when you buy your arms, I must exercise my right to use that responsibly. Because I know that we need also arms to defend ourselves. Because the people who are attacking us are carrying arms. So it is not a very, a very easy debate. And I don't want to be misunderstood as whether I'm supporting or not. But I think that there is, like I said repeatedly, there is a place for responsibility on both sides. And if we act responsibly, then peace will come. Uh, guns or weapons or nuclear plant or anything you do, deal for it. You're responsible for human rights and for children that they are in future willing to live in peace. When you are having gun to defense and you're selling gun, so you uh, promoting the war. So uh, you, you cannot be responsible what the person thinks about war and about peace. You are responsible for yourself. You cannot teach the responsibility for uh, generations that they like to fight uh, 
as Islamists or others. So uh, in this case, I don't think so. It's uh, like logic. Yeah, that idea is good. We are responsible. But if the person uh, it's known as responsible for generation, you can count on that person and yeah, you say his customer or I am. I'm, uh, so uh, the responsible person, do you need defense for it? For a responsible society or responsible government? You need to sell defense, uh, uh, you need a defense for yourself and you need to sell weapon for fight for future for, I don't know, I don't understand, I, don't, I cannot find, it's opposite. Uh, you talk about peace and also you, uh, you uh, support the war. Uh, that is like, I feel like I'm from Iran and I feel the pain so much. And I born in Iraq, uh, I mean, I, I passed the Iraq war, and after that, uh, the pressure from government, so I understand exactly what you're trying to say about responsibility. But what I couldn't find this was responsibility, and I hadn't gone to fight for my rights, because no one's selling gun to me, so I don't want to have war. So, uh, it's not rubbish. <laughs> oh, well, uh, okay. Okay, maybe you didn't understand me well, and maybe we can continue the conversation later, you know, and so that I can clarify my points very well. Um, um, like, like I've, I've always of, I've said, you know, um, we all have, we have some stake on what is going on in the world. Yes, we have stakes, and we can do our own beef, both from the from Africa and from the rest. So I am from Nigeria, and I know that people be dying there as a result, uh, you know, of maybe people using arms and guns and things like that. And I'm, I'm also I'm aware that those who are fighting them are also using arms and guns, you know, and all that. So, um, and I said that it is important that we hold on and say, look, we have, all of us have shares in this, and let's find a way, you know, to, at a, you know, come up with a framework that can, you know, bring peace. And it is not something that one party can dictate. I just don't think so. That is my stake. I think that's the bottom line of my statement. Yep. Actually, I want to speak uh, in a very different case. Um, I am wondering why are black people believing Islam? Because there exists a hadith and Muhammad didn't like black people. And even if you look in the Quran and see which kind of women the man get, this 72 or more women, they all, all of them are white. Very, very white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, and they um, are exactly the opposite type of black women. Mm -hmm. They have small breasts, mm -hmm. small backwards. <laughs> they are very slim, uh, like the mannequins uh, who are getting dying now in Europe, uh, there is no reason really uh, for black people to believe it. It's, uh, then they can also believe if I write a book and say black people are bad and black people, and then I write everything for white people, then it's unbelievable. That's what it is. Yeah, um, I don't think I have anything to add to this because uh, I, will, I would love to repeat this, amplify it, and you know, get it out there and uh, and make them understand that there's no reason for them to really be part of the religion. Um, like I think it was yesterday, I said something about um, um, decided the race, the racial content of Islam and all that, and that. And yes, I, um, I just want to make a clarification that I didn't say that because we need a black Muhammad or a black Jesus. No. We, we have enough, we have enough. <laughs> I'm telling you, we have more than enough. If you go and follow the religious discourse in Nigeria, you know we have so many of them, and including one that recently, the place is doing miracle collapse and killed over 80 something people from South Africa who came to seek miracles. Okay, so uh, that was not the argument. The argument is that we should, um, when they bring up the racist argument, we should also tell them that the representation, the, 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 the way Islam is framed, you know, is also racist, you know. Yeah, so that was actually what I wanted to say in that argument. So I agree, I can just uh, agree with you. I agree with what you said. And it's, it's left for them, you know, the people who are, you know, following Islam to think about this and uh, maybe follow your instruction. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Here, Leo. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thanks for your nice talk. 
Mein Name ist Eva Kreuz. Ich habe eine kurze Frage. Um, um, how big is the secular movement in Nigeria? Can you tell us? Okay. Um, well, the secular movement in Nigeria is small, but it's growing. Okay? Um, because we have different situations in different parts of the country. Yes. Uh, we have a Bible belt, Southeast Nigeria. We have some kind of um, Christ Islam belt, Southwest. Then we have Islamic North. So, um, it's very dangerous and risky to come out as a secular person in the North. Yeah. And uh, if they are trying to uh, execute um, um, a Muslim who said something critical of Muhammad, you can imagine what they could do to an apostate or the, what I call what the real apostate. So it's very dangerous. But you see, even that, we still have people. We, we still have a movement in the North, you know, who ex-Muslims that they are beginning to meet. And um, in fact, one of them was sent to a mental hospital. Uh, that was last year by the family because he renounced Islam. And uh, we, we campaigned. And, uh, and got him out. And you know, now think about it. If I said to the Muslims have mental problems, they said, ah, you are talking down on them. You know, you are insulting them or you are not respecting them. But did they respect these guys when he, was, he came out openly? No. They did not just tell him you're mad. They took him to a psychiatric hospital. So it's not, it's, they were serious about it. So, so these are the, that's the kind of challenge we are having there. So, but we are growing because internet has been helpful. Yes, and some of them are following what is going on here today because of the internet. So internet has been helpful, it has been powering, it has been liberating, it has been opening the space. And I think that there's a wave of secularism going on underneath there. And I know that with time, you know, the whole thing will bubble to the surface and that we can, you know, also see more, you know, something stronger, more formidable group, secular groups, you know, in, in that part of the world. Um, I have... Uh uh, one question, um, you, I think you mentioned it briefly. I uh, would like to hear your comment on the recent developments in Nigeria because there was uh, be quite unexpectedly, uh, um, basically, as I have heard, peaceful uh, change of government. So, uh, yeah, would you uh, like to comment on that? Uh, what do you think of that? Yes, we, um, I think that should be in a couple of days now. Uh, we're going to have a new president. and. Um, there was all that excitement, you know, because they wanted a change. Um, but I'm not excited. Yes, I'm not excited uh, because, um, and I said it, you know, even though I would, I'm happy that Jonathan is going because Jonathan was the one that signed the anti-gay marriage bill into law. The day he signed it, I said, okay, you can now go. Okay? Now, but the person coming to replace him for me, even has more conservative, you know, stance than even from like Jonathan. Jonathan was a little there. Whatever they tell him to do, he will do because he he wasn't the one that sent the bill to the parliament. It was actually the parliamentarians that brought the bill, and of course they wanted to use that to maybe blackmail him or something like that. And be who he is, he just signed it into law. Okay, so I'm not excited, but I don't know. Let's see what happens, you know, because. Um, the, the, the fight against Boko Haram, they said that Jonathan did not handle it well. But I want to let you know, it's not Jonathan's problem. It is a problem of Islamic establishment in northern Nigeria. They have been, you know, stoking, they have this flame, burning Nigeria now, has been there. And the paper over it. Now, this, this guy has made a statement. Nobody will arrest him for inciting violence. No, they will not arrest him. They will allow him. They rioted. They burnt down. A Sharia court. They have burned down the house of the person whom they said black male, even, the, even though the person has not been tried. They have burned down his house already. Nobody, nothing happens. Why? Oh, it has to do with Islam. Why? If you commit a crime in, in the name of Islam, go to jail. Whether you are a sheikh or a mom. Until Nigeria starts that, no way. So if this new regime is coming now to empower this in rascals, this uh, so-called uh, Boko Haram militants or Islamic militants or Sharia police, if he's coming, then it's not, it's not the change for better. It's going to be for worse. Yes, but if he's coming to rein in these militants and change the, uh, change the mentality of the people, because there's this idea that it has to be Islam, otherwise the North will not grow. No, development has no religion. Yes, the values are universal. Secular values are universal. They need to create opportunity for people there to grow. And they need to encourage people to embrace secular values so that people can live, whether they profess any religion or not, with dignity and respect. 
So if this new government moves in that direction, then the change will be changed for better. But if he comes and said, yes, I'm from northern Nigeria, and the north is ruling, and I'm Muslim, and I'll fight Boko Haram, and the whole place is rotten, and all these rascals, dimwits, you know, half-educated, uneducated Islamic scholars and whatever they call them, go around issuing fatwa here and they are rioting, running you know, amok and rampaging the whole place all in the name of Sharia. No way. The change will be changed for worse. And it's the only time that we tell.